And there was a speaker there that uh, had a question for everyone that really kind of resonated mm. with me. He said, imagine you were 12 years old right now, and what is something that you did when you were 12 years uh -huh. old that you no longer do? Right. And now say it to the person next to you. And I just went, <laughs> uh, I used to make board games, mm. which is incredibly embarrassing to admit. I would love to. I, I would just like take all the board games I had, take the pieces, and just put them on a table and think, what, 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 what could I, what kind of game could I make with this? Yeah. And like now I'm thinking, like now I'm an adult. Why am I not making that stuff? And like, do you have any mm. tips like like that, like that question that yeah. kind of drives people to figure out what their passions are, but maybe are not dormant and maybe they forgot about? Yeah, well, I love that, right? So that's always key when I'm working with a client on helping them figure out what they want to be when they grow up, quote unquote, um, tapping into what did you do as a child. And I think sometimes we think very literally with that stuff. So you go, oh, I made board games, but that's not applicable because I don't make board games now or I don't necessarily want to make board games. Um, but I would encourage you to think of, well, what, what was it about the board games? I think I know now that it's not just like making stuff, maybe, uh -huh, but uh -huh. I, I don't know. I also just like, board games are more social, right? Like okay. You're there hanging out, okay. like you're playing a game. It's okay. Cool. I don't know. See, so that makes a lot of sense, right? And particularly with what you do and building apps. I feel like I'm coaching Caesar now, <laughs> <laughs> which is totally fine. Free coaching. Um, you don't need it. Uh, but, you know, it, it could really be about, okay, well, I, I like board games. Why do I like board games? I like the social aspect. How is that missing from my life? How could I bring it into my life as an adult? Um, you know, to give, I guess, my own kind of example, uh, I first picked up the ukulele in the summer of 2011, and then I got my diagnosis in November of that year, and I, I wrote I Got Boob Cancer. It was the first song that I ever remember writing, and I went, where did this come from? I'm not a songwriter. I'm a singer. I'm a performer, but I never wrote songs before. This is so weird. Um, and then I, it, it took a few weeks, but I remembered, oh, I, I did used to write songs in my bedroom on my typewriter, because I'm old. Um, and you know, they were just like pop songs, because I wanted to be Debbie Gibson. Like, literally, that's who I wanted to be when I was 10. Um, so I think even with that, you know, think, oh, I used to write songs, or I used to love singing or performing. Well, I don't want to do that now. It doesn't have to be your main thing. I think that's what trips a lot of us up. It doesn't have to be like, oh, now I have to go into the music industry because I used to like writing songs. No, it could just be, oh, this is, this is how maybe I'm going to market my thing, or oh, maybe I'm going to offer um, something that has to do with the social aspect, or let's just make sure that I'm getting enough social time in my life, or I'm doing enough puzzles, or you know, whatever the board game pieces are. <laughs> right. I like that example. Uh, so one of the things that I find when I'm talking to people about, like, you know, friends of mine who have jobs that they don't uh -huh. like or whatever, is uh -huh. I'll say, um, it, and when, you know, there have been cases of them finally, you know, like, doing something about it. Uh -huh. And I'm always trying to, I'm always curious about figuring out when it, what is it that finally drives somebody to quit or do something about mm. something that they've wanted to do. So, do you, like, in your case, with yeah. all the people that you've coached at this point, have you seen any kind of, like, like reason that's, like, more often than not that, that drives people to find out, say, you know what, I have to do something about my situation? Yeah. Um, well, A, I think you have to be a certain type of person, and I have a feeling 100% of you guys are this type of person. You have to be a person that um, is ready and willing and able to do something about your situation. Um, I think there are a lot of people that are just like, well, work is called work because it's not play, and I'm just, this is, this is what I have to do the rest of my life. And even if there are people telling you, no, you don't, you could find your thing, they're going to go, no, no, I can't. And, and so I think the main piece, um, you know, spoiler alert in top 10 ways to discover work that feels like play, the, the number one way is like, you have to just believe that you could do it. Um, so I think that's a big piece. And then you have to go and, and do the work towards it. Um, but I lost sight of the question as I was answering. Tell me the question again. <laughs> no, I, I just, just in general, like, what is it that maybe like, tends that to drive them. somebody to say, you know what, that's it. That was the last yeah, straw. Yeah. Uh, I have to quit. I, I think, have to do this. I think it's a fulfillment issue. So when you're a person that gets a lot of your identity from your work, or you're like me and you're going, you know, I can't spend the next 40 hours a week for the next 40 years of my life on something that I don't want to do. Um, that's what drives people. And I, I get clients that are in usually varying degrees of soul-sucking jobs. So I have people that are like, you know what? I should really like my job. The people are nice, 
and I'm good at what I do, and I get paid a lot of money, and I should like it. But I don't, because it's not fulfilling for me. And then I get people that are like, this is a hell in the eighth dimension, and I have to get out now. Um, and then, you know, depending on where they are, we figure out what they need in order for them to feel comfortable and confident actually leaving that job and not fearing that they have to move into their parents' basement and eat ramen noodles for the rest of their life, which is all, you know, the grown up sphere. Right. Uh, yeah, speaking of the whole grown up sphere thing, yeah. is, uh, do you find that, I mean, like your, your title would be a coach, like a life coach mm -hmm. or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So you find that people often maybe don't seek something like that out because they're embarrassed to say, I am going to hire life a life coach. You know, like I, you know, yeah. maybe somebody say, oh, I don't need a life coach. I know what I'm doing. I can figure yeah. it out. But like maybe some people do need yeah. that, but it's a, maybe it's embarrassing. Or, or yeah. Not. Well, you know, there's a reason I'm, I'm certified as a life coach, but my title is a creative career coach. And I kind of do that because um, I have the same stigma with life coaches. Uh, not so much anymore, but really it did stop me when I first heard about life coaching. And I was looking for something that was just the opposite of life coach. I was like, no, it's finally time for me to like, be a grown up. I found life coaching and I was like, people are going to think that I don't shave my armpits and they're going to think I'm going to read their crystals and like, I don't want to give people that impression of me. And then once I discovered more about it and that life coaching is this, um, and hopefully it'll get to be a, a better well-known industry that people kind of know this, but life coaching is just kind of the foundation for you to, to be able to work with clients on wherever they're stuck in their lives to help them get unstuck. Um, so that's really my foundation, but then I've built on that, you know, different career coachy, you know, exercises and, and things, but that specifically help creative people. So like, yes, but no. Gotcha. Uh, one last question yeah. is, do you have some examples of uh, some yeah. of your clients and yes. where they were and now what they're doing now? Yeah, um, I know we're short on time, so I'll tell just my, my I want to say my favorite story, but they're all my favorite stories, you guys. Um, I have a client, her name is Alexandra Franzen. Everyone go to her website, write it down on your postcard. She is a mind-blowing genius. Um, and she came to me when I was still at my executive assistant job. Um, and it was January of 2010. And she said to me, Michelle, I have my dream job at NPR for the last few years. I moved to Minneapolis from Los Angeles because I had this dream of working in NPR. And I've been here now for a few years. And it's not what I want. And I know I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know what that looks like. Can you help me? Oh, and by the way, I just gave four months notice. Which was like the weirdest thing, right? Who gives four months notice? She goes, but I just told my boss that I'm leaving in April. So I have until April to figure this out. And we went, OK, let's figure it out. So we really worked together on her different skills and what she wanted to work on, what she wanted to build. Um, and she ended up, when we were done working together, you know, had a, a basic site. And she was going to do copywriting. Um, copywriting for businesses, and also she was really passionate and excited about resume building, like untraditional resume building and branding. So, and I talk about Renaissance souls all the time, total Renaissance souls. She liked to write, she liked to design, she kind of wanted to work on a few different things, and she said, I'm going to be like a resume brander, copywriter, and then also offer copywriting services to businesses. Um, and she did that for probably about a year, um, successfully made her rent, and was able to live off of that, didn't have to move in with her parents. Um, but she realized after she was doing these resumes, more and more that she, the resumes weren't so exciting and you know what, she didn't really want to do the graphic design anyway. So instead she moved into copywriting essentially um, fully and she created this offering that was really new and different at the time um, where she was going to work with you for one day. Uh, I forget exactly what it was, what it was called but she said, you're, you know, we're Skyping at 10 o'clock and you're going to have the copy for your entire website by 7 o'clock that night. And people went nuts. Um, and right now, she has a book that actually is coming out today. She's going to have another book that comes out a few months from now. She sold out. She's writing workshops around the country, sold out cr like crazy. She's been sold out for private clients, like an 18-month waiting list. Um, and by my, by my calculations, I think she makes probably close to like a quarter of a million dollars a year. Um, so that's like my 
favorite success story. It's Alexandra Franzen, F-R-A-N-Z-E-N.com, and she's lovely and wonderful and fabulous and so nice. That's why it's one of my favorite stories, too. <laughs>